Paul Memorial, Blackford, J, IU Health North, West, and Reed Health. And especially because we are recording, please uh, be sure to silence all of your electronic devices. And if you do need to get up and uh, return a call, uh, please leave the auditorium to do so. Um, Dr. Cleary, our speaker today, has no relevant financial conflicts of interest to disclose. And now I will turn over for the bio. Um, and I will rush through the introduction for Dr. Cleary because I saw that he's got about 682 slides. And I want to make sure he has a chance to get through all of them today. So Dr. Cleary is a professor of medicine at the IU School of Medicine and the Walther Senior Chair and Director of Supportive Oncology at IU and the Simon Cancer Center. He's a graduate of the University of Adelaide Medical School in South Australia, where he trained in internal medicine and medical oncology at the Royal Adelaide Hospital, followed by three years of opioid pharmacology research. He then moved to the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 1994, where he served as the founding medical director of the Palliative Care Clinical Program from 1996 through 2011. During that time, he also served as program director of cancer control at the UW Cancer Center, integrating palliative care into that program and as chair of that, their scientific review committee. In 2004, he served as the president of the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine and still serves as a North American editor of Palliative Medicine, the research journal of the European Association of Palliative Care. He was director of the Pain and Policy Studies Group from 2011 through 2018 and co-leads the Global Opioid Policy Initiative that reviewed opioid availab availability in Africa, Asia, the Caribbean, and Latin America, India, and the Middle East. He's also co-chaired the Breast Health Global Initiative's Resource Stratified Guidelines for Palliative Care, and is a member of the World Health Organization's Cancer Pain Guideline Committee, the Lancet Commission on Palliative Care, and co-chair of ASCO's Resource Stratified Guideline on Palliative Care. So it's easy to see why he was recently honored as one of 30 global visionaries in palliative care by the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Care. We are fortunate uh, here at IU and IU Health that we were able to lure him away from Wisconsin. And he started working here in July of 2018 as Director of Supportive Oncology, holding the Walther Senior Chair in Supportive Oncology. So welcome to Dr. Cleary. We look forward to your remarks. The United States is ever-changing, as we saw last night, but we're con constantly berated with this sort of information. We're a nation that is hooked on opioids. We're a nation where the last presidential candidate for the Democrats actually said it's incomprehensible that the FDA approved OxyContin for children. The implication is it's much safer and better to give unapproved medications to children with cancer. And this is despite the WHO having guidelines that tell us that opioids are an essential part of treating children with persistent pain. So while we have this excess, there is clearly a huge abyss, as the Lancet Commission has shown, in lack of access to palliative care and pain relief. And this shows graphically the report of the Lancet Commission with access to morphine around the world, showing by the size of the country, the United States, Europe and Australia almost unrecognisable because of their bloating, whereas the rest of the world not recognised. So today I'm going to be addressing a number of crises, and you'll notice I didn't use the word crisis, it is crises, and we will be addressing these. As Greg mentioned, I am a palliative care physician and the National Quality Consensus Project, the National Guidelines, new ones released just this week, ethical and legal aspects of care are so important. And so what do they define these as? Patient preferences are respected. The team is aware and addresses complex ethical issues and that we're knowledgeable about the statutes, both federal and state as we go forward. A number of years ago, I was asked to speak in Bangkok for the Asian Pacific meeting. They gave me the wonderful topic, the integration and harmony of wisdom. So I had to look up wisdom, and it turns out wisdom came from Buddha and Thailand. So that was a challenge. 
But what is wisdom? Understands ambiguity better, grasps a deeper meaning of what is known, and understands the limit of knowledge. So one of the things that I hope to do today is to impart some wisdom um, and share that with you. It really is an honour to be here at the, uh, the Fairbanks and the Respect Centre's lecture and to be giving this. Thank you, Greg and Susan, for the invitation. Greg mentioned I have no conflicts or associations of interest. I prefer that term than conflicts. There may be associations, there may not be conflict. But up until 2010, the program that I was not directing at the time, but associated with, did receive some pharmacological industry support um, consistent with WHO, WHO conflict of interest rules. But my objectives are outlined there. We're going to be addressing balance, identifying different barriers, and addressing the ethical issues as they relate to opioid availability for our patients. So these are the ethical issues. To do good, beneficence, non-maleficence, which I actually got out this time. I struggle with that word. Don't do bad. Issue of justice and autonomy. So let's turn to beneficence. What evidence do we have that the opioids are some good? And I'm going to look at the palliative care literature from here. The first home for the dying that we know of, 1842 in Lyon, France. And we can see Paris, 1875, and this same group of women came to establish Calvary Hospice in New York in 1899. So if you hear people saying that hospice is a modern phenomenon, it goes back now 119 years in the United States that we know of. It is not that recent. But if we look at morphine, synthesized or identified in 1811, I actually do tell people when they're looking for natural products that morphine is a natural product. It comes from the poppy and you can see the poppy there. It became popular in, during the Civil War because it was that time that the hypodermic needle was invented. So we could give injections of morphine at this stage. Heroin was first synthesized in 1874 and marketed by Bayer Pharmaceuticals, yes, the makers of aspirin, as a cough suppressant, less addictive than morphine. That's how it was marketed. Sounds familiar. Things haven't changed. And other things haven't changed much as well. Opium wars were on. Um, this was Britain versus China. And basically, the English were shipping opium from uh, the Indian subcontinent to China, and they had a big war. And then the first International Opium Commission was established in 1909, and guess what? The US and China pulled out. Not much has changed. Um, so as we look at this history as we move forward, in 1915, and largely because of problems with opioid dependency or misuse in the Philippines, Missionaries came back and said, we nearly need to crack down on opioid use in the, uh, in the United States. And the Harrison Act came out. Then the Dangerous Drug Act. 25,000 physicians were actually up on narcotic charges. 3,000 went to jail. During World War II, while this was still continuing on, because of the drying up of the supply in the Burma Triangle with the Japanese occupation, there was no addiction uh, seen or very little opioid addiction seen in civil societies. And a very interesting historical context, every soldier that landed in D-Day had in their possession morphine. They didn't have the needle to inject it, the medics had the needle, but every soldier actually had this little styrene. And so when the, the uh, medics came along, they could get the morphine. They actually found at the beaches of Anzio in Italy that they were seeing morphine overdoses. And it turns out they had no way of identifying whether a soldier had got morphine prior to getting to the battle station. So they started pinning these little styrets, styrets, sorry, to the lapels of the soldiers so they knew this was a safety measure in terms of protecting patients from the toxicity of opioids. Most of the opioids that we know had actually been developed by prior, prior to World War II. Um, we can see pethidine there. Many of them developed in Germany at the time. Cecily Saunders really um, popularised or started the initiative with the regular administration of opioids when she actually discovered that the nuns at a hospice in London 
We're giving four hourly morphine to the patients, cancer patients. Why? The nuns had tried to change physician practice to get it given more regularly and the physicians wouldn't change their practice. So the nuns just decided that four hourly PRN meant they could actually give the medicine every four hours and the patient quality of life improved. Cecily Saunders documented this and went on and really made her career from this situation. 1960, fentanyl was synthesized in Belgium by Paul Janssen, hence the name Janssen Pharmaceuticals. And this era is significant because in 1960, the United Nations met and then signed in 1961 the Single Convention of Narcotic Drugs. This is how the UN works. And this framework says that we will not only prevent abuse and diversion, but ensure the availability of these drugs, I use the term medicines now as rather than drugs, for medical purposes, a dual priority. The medical use of narcotic drugs continues to be um, indispensable and adequate provision must be made to ensure the availability for such purposes. We have to ask that question of the United States at the moment. Are we in a balanced situation? Work was ongoing in uh, the United Kingdom with Cecily Saunders. Robert Twycross was actually researching the use of heroin um, for patients at the end of life. And to this date, heroin is still the most commonly used opioid for people at the end of life in the United Kingdom. Will surprise you. But I actually, I, have anyone prescribed heroin in the United States? I suspect not. <laughs> but I have actually prescribed in my career Brompton cocktail. And this was a standard mixture that we're actually using. You can see some nice goodies in there, a little bit of gin, tincture of cabinets, a little bit of cocaine. Surely you feel good when you got some of this. This was developed and published in The Lancet in 1893, and we were still using that in my career. So we didn't make a lot of progress. 77, the WHO actually came out and said, opioids are part of their essential medicines list. And we can see codeine and morphine there. What you're seeing graphically along the background now is the consumption of opioids per different country. And I've highlighted the United States in blue, um, Australia in gold, and Germany in green here. Just follow their progress. This is a picture of my parents. My father's a physician. My mother was a hospice nurse who gave the first dose of oral morphine in Adelaide, Australia, while I was a medical student. The patient didn't die after 10 milligrams of oral morphine. That's how new much of this work is. And I've stress this because in, as a second year resident in Adelaide, Australia, I saw our first case of HIV, 1986. And we really have to start saying, wow, what progress have we made with HIV and why are we still struggling with pain relief so much at this stage? The Wisconsin Cancer Pain Initiative was formed in the 70s and this was June Dahl and David Joranson. Um, were asked by different people, including the uh, Assistant Sur Surgeon General, to really address the role of heroin for pain relief based on the English experience. And they went forward with support from the National Institute of Drug Abuse to show that making morphine available to cancer pain for cancer patients did not see any increase in crime, abuse, misuse, um, diversion. Charlie Cleland, also at Wisconsin and through the Eastern Cooperative Oncology Group, did research at the time on pain treatment of people with metastatic cancer in the United States. 42% of our major cancer centres, including IU at the time, were undertreated. And you were more likely to be undertreated if you're an older minority female. And that, I don't think, has changed that much in our country at the moment. The WHO came out in the... Uh, 1986 with its first set of guidelines, with the ladder which became important. Um, and we can see though that global opioid consumption is really not increasing. The Journal of Clinical Oncology came out with guidelines for cancer care at the last phase of life and promoted increased access to morphine. And we can actually see two bumps up here. This was the introduction of uh, sustained release morphine products. And now we see this rapid curve with the introduction of uh, OxyContin, 
So the involvement of pharmaceutical companies in marking opioids became absolutely critical. The Institute of Medicine put out this report in 1999 on pain, saying that patients have greater expectations, musculoskeletal disorders are happening more commonly, and I can attest to that as I age, um, increasing survivorship from injury and cancer, and increasing f uh, frequency and complexity of surgery. So there was a real societal demand coming out for this. And we saw this pain as a fifth volatile sign. And this is often criticised at the moment, that this really brought about a change in our culture in promoting opioids. This was actually an initiative of the VA. And many people forget this. Yes, pharmaceutical companies put it up. But nowhere in the fifth vital sign, pain is a fifth vital sign, did it say use opioids. It said assess pain. Now, was this used by others, marketing companies? Did we have anything else to provide? Maybe not, and that may be one of the significant issues. But also around this time, it's important to look and remember that HIV was really taking off and there were a huge number of deaths related to palliative um, AIDS, HIV AIDS at that time. And as we sought to provide palliative care for these people, it was often a struggle. So David Joranson, together with colleagues in Wisconsin, actually went and did survey of state medical board um, beliefs. The average age for these folks was generally in their 50s. They were older physicians. And we can see some of the changes um, that were going on. So for instance, here, addiction, when they were first surveyed in uh, 1991, a third said that addiction means physical dependence only. And with appropriate education, this came down to less than 15%. Even in 1970, 1991, um, over 60% of these state licensing uh, board members actually felt that diversion was a problem in their states, and we see that's close to 20%. So these are all the issues that were ongoing, but we see state licensing boards beginning to address this. This is a little more complex, but it follows the same survey. Just look at it, 1991, 25% of medical examining board members said it was not appropriate to give opioids to cancer patients. 25%. And then if we even go down here, and this comes in with the AIDS situa HIV situation, 88% of state licensing board people said it was not appropriate to give opioids to people with uh, non-cancer pain, even if they were near the end of life and particularly if they had a history of opioid abuse, heroin misuse, which was often true of the HIV community at, at that time. But we saw changes in that. Um, but this is the sort of perspective that was going on. In 2000, this document was written by the WHO, Achieving Balance in National Opioid Control Policy. Um, and this was written in Madison. And what it basically says is national policy should establish a drug control system prevents diversion and ensures access. Drug control measures should not interfere with the medical access to opioids. That's balance. And I think we do have to ask, do we have a balanced situation in the United States at the moment? All too often we see these triangles with the base on the solid, uh, on the, the base being uh, on the, let me put it around, with a long base, which it's much easier to hold up a triangle with a long base. Try balancing a triangle on its point. It's very difficult. But we need to do three things. Address policy, educate the community and physicians, and also ensure the availability of these medicines. So let's look at balance. Benefits, harms. This is the way we look at many of these things as we move forward. So as we look at this, and I think from the palliative care situation, there is clearly a population and it works in terms of balancing the benefits. But do no harm, don't do bad. And this is the sort of image we are currently presented with in terms of the opioids at the moment, that really they don't have any impact on uh, uh, pain relief. It's really prevention of withdrawal. And look at all these side effects. Why did anyone want to use these medications whatsoever? The challenge that we have and we need to address is, even for chronic pain patients, there is a population 
it seems maybe about 10 to 20 percent of people who use chronic opioid or opioids for chronic pain who actually do well without problems and how do we identify them so that they get the benefit the ethical um, the construct of doing good um, and reducing harm but here's examples of the data that we have on the bad Opioid analgesics increases the risks of fractures in older patients with arthritis. And they looked at these patients in the first two weeks, short-acting opioids were associated with a higher risk of fracture than long-acting opioids. So we should, that's really bad. But we need to go back and look at the data. Our patient consisted of 5,000 patients on NSAIDs and 12,000 who were using opioids, and just under half of the opioid users in this study were on propoxifen, a medicine we no longer use because it's toxic for the elderly. Yet this is the data that is still quoted to show that opioids cause falls. So we need to go back, and it seems that when we use immediate release opioids appropriately, the fall risk is not as great as described in this study. But this is still the study that is quoted as we go back, um, as we move forward. And this is one of my favourite quotes, 1891, fibs, downlight rise, lies and statistics. This is what the CDC is presenting to us at the moment, um, the problem that we have. And at the same time, the Institute of Medicine has come out with reports saying 100 million people in the United States are living with pain, not necessarily chronic, 100 million. And even people at NIDA, the National Institute of Drug Abuse, actually say that it may actually be an order of 10% of these people who may benefit from opioids. That's 10 million people. But look at this graph. Opioid sales in green, opioid deaths in red, and opioid treatment admissions, all going up at the same time. Is there anything you notice about this graph? Looks like pretty good causality, doesn't there, in association. But in actual fact, what they've done is, is put the change the scale of the opioid deaths. On the left-hand side, it's actually opioid deaths per 100,000. And on the right-hand side, I've put the opioid deaths per 10,000 the same scale as the, uh, the others. So in actual fact, you look at that graphically on the front of the Wall Street Journal, and that's nowhere, this is nowhere near as an exciting graph as this one. But that's the way that we've been presented with the data. And if we actually look at opioid deaths, or just before I go on, 60% of the opioid associated deaths are polypharmacy. Benzodiazepines may be the far more dangerous medicine in this picture than in actual fact the opioids themselves. Benzodiazepines are a respiratory depressant and when they're combined with alcohol together with the opioids, but 60% are actually associated with polypharmacy. And if we actually look at opioid deaths per kilogram of opioids sold, there's actually been almost no change in the death rate. That's that purple line down the bottom, a flat line. So yes, we probably do need to reduce the amount of opioids out in the system, but in fact the death rate per kilogram of opioids sold is actually relatively stable. The FDA did this a number of years ago when they were looking at approving the new sustained release hydrocodone product, which I can tell you I have never prescribed. Um, but in actual fact they show that the number of toxic exposures per million patient days actually decreased over time. Our use with these medicines was actually becoming safer. We talk about statistics, and I'm not going to talk much more about hydrocodone, but it probably will shock you to know that the United States consumes almost 99% of the world's hydrocodone. 99%. Well, I hope it doesn't shock you. We are the only country in the world to consume hydrocodone. So it's a useless statistic to tell us that we consume 100% of the world's hydrocodone because we, I'm wrong. There's a small cough mixture in Luxembourg which includes hydrocodone. That's why it's not 100%. But this is how we use the data. The United States consumes 99% of the, uh, the world's hydrocodone. People will tell you, look, this is the population of chronic pain in Italy, France, the United States, and here's our opioid consumption. Therefore, the conclusion from this graph is 
that the US consumes too much opioids. The reality is Italy and France may not consume enough opioids. It may be somewhere in the middle, but we can't make these inferences without really understanding the data. But this is where opioid consumption has uh, got to in the United States in blue. Germany had a bit of a jump. I'm not sure if that was a result of an election or what it was. Um, we can see other countries uh, changing. But importantly in this, in the process of ordering opioids, the DEA has actually approved every one of these requests to increase opioids in the United States, our consumption. So this is the government, as much as they come back and say it's pharmaceutical companies, it's all these other physicians, it's everything else, the DEA has actually approved and requested the amount of opioids that we've consumed in the country every year. This is a multi-pronged process that we really need to understand much, much better as we move forward. So even in the lay press, and Sally Satel is a psychiatrist at Yale, and she's actually now putting this out there, um, the myth of what's driving the opioid crisis. I think this is a wonderful study from Dartmouth um, where they actually looked at what happens to patients um, with surgical operations. So they took breast cancer surgery, uh, laparoscopic collies, um, inguinal hernia repair, and I'll show you some of that data. What they actually looked at was the number of opioids prescribed, and you can see them here, and the number of opioids consumed. And we can see that almost for the simple mastectomy, partial mastectomy patients, the patients were prescribed on average um, six to 20 tablets. 75% of the women did not use a single tablet whatsoever. Um, we can see for those who got uh, lumpectomies, they actually consumed a little more opioids, but in general, they got somewhere from 30, um, sorry, 20 to 30 opioids tablets at that time, but they didn't consume nearly that much. And there's some 300,000 partial mastectomies or breast cancer surgeries a year um, in the United States. This is the inguinal hernia stuff. Um, 30, patients was the, 30 tablets was the average prescribed, and we can actually see here that close to 50% uh, of people didn't use a single opioid. These are the opioids that are now very much sitting around in our bathroom cupboards, not being, uh, um, waiting to be misused. There are some one million inguinal hernia operations a year in the United States. So we need to start looking at these. Take back programs are very, very important part of what we're doing in terms of reducing some of the risk of these things. Prescription monitoring programs are in place and there's evidence that these are beginning to work, that we're seeing a reduction in the number of uh, uh, prescribing, the doctor shopping is very important. But just yesterday, as I was scanning for predictions for last night in the Wisconsin papers, I saw this headline, Doctors, dentists and nurses prescribing most opioids under investigation. I love newspaper headlines because I can't think of anyone else who's allowed to prescribe opioids than doctors, <laughs> dentists and nurses. But that's always an interesting twist as you, uh, you move forward. But they actually, seven doctors are under investigation. There are 16 dentists, 12 of whom are under investigation for not using the PMP. So there's four. So if you actually look at the number of doctors, and that should actually just be seven, not 47, it's 0.04% of, of doctors in Wisconsin are under investigation for poor prescribing of opioids. 0.046%. More significantly, and I picked this, this up on a, uh, a media thing that I follow from in, about the uh, India, and here's a physician in Alabama, and it really is quite significant. He's up on fraud charges. And if we actually look at the data, sorry, it blew up here, 423 prescriptions a day if he worked five days a week and resulted in about 12.3 million pills. I have, Epic wouldn't even have allowed me to do that in Wisconsin. I don't think Cerner would. The nurses would be changing the printing paper too often to actually say, hey, what's going on here now as we write these prescriptions? That is not practice of medicine. And I think that's something that we need to look at. And this guy is now being charged. And that's significant. 
This is again from the CDC page, and this is understanding all this stuff that opioids are bad. What you may not have noticed as you look at this page of all this, the opioid um, deaths, methadone contributed to nearly one in three prescription painkiller deaths in 2009. Methadone. So you look at that and say, wow. And here's some data from 2005. This reporter, uh, Mr. Raymond, actually got the Pulitzer Prize for this research. Here is the grams of methadone prescribed, small percentage of opioids in Washington state, and yet it represented 50% of the deaths in Washington state. And this is not methadone for um, uh, opioid dependency syndrome. We know those people, they're identified. But what they actually found was that the state had mandated that Medicaid patients should actually get methadone rather than Oxycontin as an alternative to morphine. And he geocoded this and showed that it was poor areas of um, Seattle where people were actually dying. And I talked to Tom Frieden about this with the CDC. There were 14 states that had some mandate for the use of methadone, although most physicians don't know how to prescribe methadone. Longer half-life, lipid soluble, all sorts of issues. But I suspect it was iatrogenic prescribing of methadone that was contributing at one stage to a third of the deaths. The VA even had a situation where many residents, if they want to change someone from morphine to another opioid, the computer said prescribe methadone. Many of the residents I spoke to said as soon as they saw that, they decided not to change because it was just too difficult. But there's documentation that methadone was a leading factor in the, many of the opioid deaths, and as the CDC documented, up to a third. And I think that's because we did not know how to prescribe these medicines. As we look at opioid-associated deaths, there are many other factors going on, including non-medical users. And I would ask, how many of you have misused opioids? All right, like Bill Clinton, you don't have to admit it. Did you, uh, I didn't inhale. How many of you have misused opioids? So this becomes, what is misuse? A doctor did not direct you how to use them. Use without a prescription on the respondent's own. Greater amounts, so when they say you can take one tablet every six hours and you took one four hours apart, that's misuse. Use in any other way the doctor told you not to. Having alcohol with them. So the example that I talk about publicly is that I actually had knee surgery, the, um, sorry, dental surgery. This was wisdom teeth. Um, they gave me a prescription for 30 tablets. I actually used tablets that were in the cupboard from my daughter's wisdom teeth. That's misuse. So I've misused. And we ask why physicians don't hand back their opioids because we all want to actually have them there for that rainy day when we need them. Um, so we may actually be some of the worst culprits. So misuse is an important criteria. And that's the number that we're often given. 60% of Americans misuse because of pain. And it may actually be a girl at school, young girl at school, who's got some menstrual cycle pain, and a friend gives her a Vicodin to actually relieve that pain. That is misuse. I'm not saying it's correct, but that's important to actually identify it. The nursing person who's got a horrible headache but doesn't want to go home. A colleague says, oh, I've got some uh, uh, Vicodin in my cupboard, do you want half? So that's all misuse that we need to actually look at very carefully. And this is from JAMA uh, Internal Medicine. Very busy slide, so I've blown it up a little bit to actually look at this. What they show you here is the number of days of non-medical use. So it goes from th a month, three months, going out to just beyond six months and then longer. And we can see that as we move across and people who are misusing many more days, they start buying tablets. So close to half are buying tablets here um, as we move forward. Whereas, and this is a definite change in percentages um, that we see. So the misusers are far more likely to steal or buy from friends and colleagues. If we look at this, um, this is a statistic uh, from Wisconsin. 
57% um, of 12th graders who've used narcotics other than heroin were given them free from a friend or relative. And again, I think this comes back to this medical um, use that people are using them for the relief of uh, pain and other such things. I remember talking to a physician who actually told me, um, you know, Dr. Cleary, I used to believe what you did and I was very liberal with my opioids, but when I found out that the high school quarterback was sharing his Vicodin that I prescribed for him to the rest of the team, I stopped. And my response was, why were you giving Vicodin to the high school quarterback? There's a real problem if we've actually succumbed to... Now, he had to play. Of course he had to play. He's the high school quarterback. Friday Night Lights. I've been there. Um, but this is a graph showing the opioid prescribing um, across all the counties in uh, uh, the United States, and I'm going to blow up Indiana. Um, I will tell you I've just moved from a low prescribing down to a middle and my, I'm not sure what the aim is, but we can see the northwest and down here we've actually, it's the more southern uh, counties which start coming in darker in terms of the number of opioid prescriptions. This was an interesting study, particularly in view of last night's results. This was the opioid prescribing in the, uh, the top and this is the counties that voted for Trump on the bottom. And the paper actually came out, this is not, he wasn't on the ballot last night. Um, this was actually a study that came out and there was an association between opioid uh, uh, use and vote Trump counties that voted for Trump. Again, associations, no causality. And that's important to remember. And we can look at this by states in terms of opioid prescribing um, overall. And, but others have now actually looked at this and said as we compare the different states in the United States, prescription rates versus deaths, there is no correlation on a state basis. As we look at opioid-related ER visits, no correlation between the prescriptions and the ER visits. So something else is probably going on as we look at this data. And this is having a very significant impact. And as we look at this, this is a letter from... Uh, uh, Attorney General Bondi from Florida, who actually says, you know, we've actually done some things. Florida allowed physicians to dispense opioids. And why? This was because rural patients didn't have access to pharmacies. So they managed to shut down 500 pill mills and they removed their 98 of the top 100 prescribers of hydrocodone who were in the state. They actually reduced the uh, opioids oxycodone death rate by overdose rate by 65 and the deaths by 30 percent and this was by simply changing a simple regulation that physicians were no longer able to dispense opioids and this is from a colleague in Miami who has actually shown and this is a comparison with Florida and North Carolina and they actually shut down these pill mills and we can actually see that the prescription overdose deaths dropped stayed stable as in the comparative state and we can actually see the total opioids drop significantly while they rose in the Carolinas, in North Carolina. And then the biggest factor in this was in actual fact, the increase in heroin deaths in North Carolina, um, as opposed to only a small increase in heroin deaths in, uh, in Florida. But these are the issues. But um, Attorney General Bondi goes on to talk about why they've done these things, they're now aware that even hospice patients are being denied access to opioids. And why pharmacists are being told you can only dispense the same amount of opioids as every other pharmacist in the state. If you've got 30 patients, we're only going to allow you to dispense to 20. You decide which patients you're going to cut off. So this is a real challenge as we move forward. And some of this has been led by the CDC guidelines. So I think it's important to look at these. Um, they are for adults, they're not for children. Um, and they say, let's use immediate release opioids when starting, don't have a problem. Use the lowest effective dose, yes, don't have a problem. Prescribe short durations for acute pain, don't have a problem at all. But then they start talking about the maximum doses of opioids that we can use. 
And it's important when you go back at these references and actually look at them. Opioid dosing trends and mortality in Washington state workers. This was actually a study that looked at 32 deaths from a number of patients. 15 of them were on oxycodone and 22 were on methadone. But this is the data on which our dose limitations are based. 32 deaths of which 32 were on methadone. I've already told you there were problems with the way we were using methadone. That's not sound statistical data. And the study even goes on to say, let's use, let's get more research to actually show this. And this is another study that was done again in Washington State. 51 opioid-related overdoses, of which there are actually four, um, including six deaths. And that's, again, the study that is being used to show that there's a correlation between toxicity, death rates, and the dose of opioids that we're uh, prescribing. Again, this paper says we need more data. But these are the quoted references in the CDC guidelines. So if we look at this, we can see methadone surging around 2006, but still a significant issue as we move forward. But we also see the synthetic opioids increasing in consumption. And this is actually looking at the uh, age group of people um, as we move forward in terms of where is the rapid rise coming. Most of these people, the younger generation, are not prescribed opioids at all. And it's probably from the misuse of these that it's becoming significant. This was a good paper from the New England Journal of Medicine looking at non-medical prescription opioid use and heroin use. And what we're actually seeing here is heroin use climbing significantly in our country. And people say that's because the opioids are actually drying up. Um, the prescribed opioids are drying up. They're dropping some, but not a lot. And there's even data coming out now from researchers that is suggesting that the first opioid of use in some populations is in fact heroin. It is so cheap. And if you've read, any of you have read the book Dreamlands, it illustrates how cheap black tar heroin is that's coming from Mexico at the moment. So these are significant factors as we move forward. So if we even look at this whole synthetic opioid, as we move to Massachusetts and the data, we can actually see that almost all the deaths in Massachusetts now associated with opioids are actually related to fentanyl and its analogues. Very little of it is related to prescribed opioids. And there's even people who've gone and done this and said, okay, here's actually what's really happening with the uh, fentanyl products, synthetic opioids. We've got these um, illicit fentanyl now in red. And so that's been the recent increase. The current problem that we have is illicit fentanyl. And this is shown with all the opioids that this recent bump in the last three, four years is actually related to illicit fentanyl coming in. I'm giving you some Indiana data here. We can see heroin in red, the synthetic opioids in purple certainly surging in the same way, the prescription opioids bumping along at the same sort of rate for the last 10 years. And again, this is the uh, opioid-related deaths um, and the, the statistic here, deaths related to synthetic opioids increased from 43 to 304 per annum because of illicit fentanyl in this uh, state. So this is a significant issue. And it's interesting in a publication, four people from the CDC said, let's look at this data. And they've actually changed, but they didn't put out a major CDC thing. This is a letter in a journal. And what they effectively showed was that while they were telling us that 32,000 deaths were related to uh, opioids, they've now corrected this to say it's 17,000 because most of the others were related to synthetic opioids. This problem being painted to me is one that we need to really understand. We have a problem. Houston, we have a problem. I don't get me wrong but let's understand the problem pro properly if we're going to address it properly. This is an example of car fentanyl. This is the medicine you use to anaesthetize elephants. Any of you have an elephant, you probably, you may need some car fentanyl, <laughs> but you're actually going to be told, people will know that. You can import a kilogram, 2.2 pounds of car fentanyl um, from China for two and a half thousand dollars. 
And if you were to do a sort of James Bond type thing and drop this over uh, Manhattan, you'd probably anaesthetize the state of uh, the city of Manhattan. This is a very, very potent opioid, um, but it's actually now creeping and appearing into our opioids, people mixing mixing it, and it's really causing a lot of this toxicity. So you can see the fentanyl products moving up the top, benzodiazepines, and the light blue is prescription opioids in terms of opioid-related deaths, and this is in Massachusetts. So coming back to the CDC guidelines, the other thing that they actually tell us, and well, they tell us that these are the rules and they're only guidelines, but we have pharmacies, and I use CVS because I think I have to use CVS now, under my insurance plan. But these are the rules that the pharmacies are now actually telling us. And I had a patient, re a pharmacy called me up in Wisconsin who said, I have an 86 year old woman with ovarian cancer who's requesting naloxone in the home. And I said, really, she requested it? Well, I actually recommended it to her and I think it's a good thing. And I said, why did you recommend it to her? Oh, it's in the CDC guidelines. And I said, have you read the CDC guidelines? No, it's company policy. So the CDC guidelines actually are not intended for patients who are in active cancer treatment, palliative care or end of life care. But these are now being implemented across the board. So the question I raise is very much both a question of autonomy and justice. How do we balance these very issues of justice and autonomy as we move forward? Doesn't a patient have the right to, with appropriate consent, to say that they will have these um, medications? Are we putting the public health issues beyond the individual rights of our patients? And then it's informed consent's very important. And I'd actually go back to a letter from Dr. Howry of the CDC. This was a patient who wrote and said, I've been on chronic doses of opioids and now because of the CDC guidelines, my doctor has been told he has to reduce them. And the physician from CDC wrote back and said, CDC encourages physicians to continue to use their clinical judgment and base their treatment on what they know about their patients. This is the ultimate goal of the guidelines to ensure people who need them have access to these opioids while reducing opioid related deaths. So this is a significant thing as we move forward. But one of the suggestions raised that the pool limits are not a smart way to fight this crisis. But equally we have the implications, hospital shortages are now taking place. And this was an email that Cathy Foley from Memorial Sloan Kettering shared with me earlier this year, that in fact Memorial Sloan Kettering, the major cancer center in the country, was running short of opioids because of supply issues. Some of this relates to production. A lot of it also relates to a hurricane in Puerto Rico where many of the opioids are actually mixed um, and uh, worked on. So as we look at these global crisis, these crises, I've just in the finish turn to this global crisis. This is the opioid death for many of the countries of the world. And we can see that there doesn't seem to be much correlation with other higher consuming countries. So justice to me takes on an even more important issue when we do look at the rest of the world. And this is again the Lancet documentation of the access to morphine, United States, Australia and Europe, the only recognisable countries. And we can see as we divide income into different quadrants, we in the purple with high income have good access to opioids, the upper middle income countries some, but really the rest of the world no access. And this is demonstrated by this story of this patient. Here in the rural outskirts of Calcutta, India, top-notch medical care is hard to come by. But Dr. Abhijit Dam makes do. The day we met him, he had transformed this school courtyard into a makeshift clinic and virtual pharmacy dispensing drugs for a variety of ailments. But when he heard reports of a woman dying of breast cancer in a neighboring village, Dr. Dam knew he was in for a challenge. The woman named Fatima had a massive breast tumor, clearly infected. Oops, sorry.
clearly infected, so this is clearly an issue that is important and significant. There are many impediments as we move around the world to look at the availability of narcotic drugs as we move forward, and the International Narcotic Control Board has defined these. And fear of addiction is a major issue. Fear of diversion, cost is also an issue as we move forward. The Lancet published this in the, um, the report of the International Narcotic Control Board, and they actually talked about, in, uh, asked us to write an editorial, increasing worldwide access to opioids. And the thing I'm most proud about this editorial is a quote from Thomas the Tank Engine. You are lucky, Gordon, to have a controller who knows how to run railways. Controllers aren't there to necessarily restrict, but to make systems run properly. And the International Narcotic Control Board is there to make sure that systems run properly. But they haven't been doing this. This is an example of opioid availability in Eastern Europe and Western Europe, the high income countries of Western Europe, good consumption, Western Europe very, Eastern Europe very poor. Nathan Cherney, an Australian colleague now in Israel, actually looked at opioid availability and cost in Western Europe. You got the medicines across the top, um, medicines across the top, and basically you got the countries, the Western Europe had these. We actually have an example here um, of Eastern Europe where most countries didn't have anything. And in fact, some countries didn't even have immediate release morphine. And one country actually had only injectable morphine available. People in more than half the countries around the globe have limited access to medical morphine. And of that number, more than half face severe shortages of pain medication. Here in Ukraine, some of the same bureaucratic hurdles that plague India mean that even a former decorated KGB colonel is left to die in pain. Artur Shumanov has stage four prostate cancer and is living out the end of his life alone and suffering. It got so bad, he says, he's left his family in Kiev and moved to this cottage in a remote village hours from the capital. The undertreatment of pain is a huge, huge issue. In Ukraine, pain is part of life. Mm -hmm. We can see the mark where the radiotherapy was given. We invited Dr. James Cleary, a leading authority on global palliative care, to join us of the scope of the problem here. Because of his pain, he's cut himself off from his family. What greater time is there for a man to need his family than when he's facing advanced disease? But what did he say? He didn't want them to see him cry. Artur has found his own way to numb his agony. And if it gets bad enough, Artur showed us his other plan to stop the pain. To watch Arturo reach under his pillow as he's talking about potentially ending his own life and then just pulling out this gun. This is not a gun in a cupboard. This is a gun that he sleeps on. So clearly the severe, the impact of this severe pain is great if he's that close most of the time. That was not staged. In actual fact, the cameraman asked him to do it again because he wasn't sure if he captured it. And Arturo said no. He died three months later, not from uh, suicide. But in fact, there was a patient, a person, colleague, who was diverting morphine from other patients to Arturo to make sure that he could actually get appropriate pain relief. I'm not sure I would do that for my patients in this country. Um, there's even a clip where they had me in a video with, uh, in a van with some people transporting morphine. I didn't know, and I could have gone to jail for three years in Ukraine if we'd actually been caught. But this suicide issue is really having an impact around the world. Russia's just given uh, significant funds because a number of high-powered military were actually committing suicide because of lack of cancer pain relief.
But we've got this major inequity around the world. But ethically, we as a country need to be very careful as well because already, as with tobacco, the pharma industry is moving out and beginning to sell these products in low- and middle-income countries. And we need to make sure that these countries have a balanced system as they move forward. And as we integrate palliative care across the, uh, the process, we need to make these medicines available, we need to change policy, and we need to educate. But I finish by alerting you to the fact that balance is not necessarily easy to achieve and maintain. <laughs> Ouch. But we need to, in this country, really work on ethical principles to ensuring that we have a balanced approach to access to opioids. Thank you very much. And there are availability for questions, microphones, and you can text questions. We still have a few more minutes for questions. Or comments. You can tell me I'm being uh, her heretical. Thank, yep. Thank right. you very much again. Thank you, Dr. Cleary.